Welcome to our broadcast and a conversation about the fascination of Tibetan Buddhism in the West. So I think that first the, the Hollywood aspect and the music and got people interested in it because culturally Tibet is very interesting. Tibetan Buddhism, next. This is Talk About Our Times. I'm Lich. Jeff Allen is here. He's the translator for Kenjo or Rinpoche Labsang Tenzin Geshe Wandak at the Chenrezig Tibetan Buddhist Center in Middletown, Connecticut. Jeff began his studies in Tibetan Buddhism in 1995. By 98, when Rinpoche relocated from Ithaca, New York to Middletown, Jeff started his educational process in Tibetan Buddhism under Rinpoche's guidance and direction, as well as becoming his assistant. The year was 2001 when Jeff took his leave to South India and studied where Rinpoche had studied at Drepong Losaling Monastic University. There, Jeff honed his skills as a debater in Buddhist philosophy as presented in the five great philosophical texts. After returning to the United States, he again took up the position as the translator for Rinpoche at the Chenrezig Tibetan Buddhist Center, and I am pleased to be joined by my brother in life, Jeff Allen, and welcome. Thanks a lot, Lich. Nice Appreciate to have it. you here. Pleasure to be here. The essence of your core belief as a Buddhist, the gratification, the satisfaction. I want you to tell me how it enriches your life. When I first started looking at Buddhism, uh, I was pretty spiritually bankrupt. I uh, just needed some form of path. I really was looking for something to hold on to. And I had been brought up with, you know, traditional religions. I never had any kind of bad experience. I just never really connected to them. And I always had a lot of questions that bothered me to my core. Uh, we speak about core beliefs. And, and I felt like everything that I had been taught, there were questions that I had about it. I was taught about that God created everything and, 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 and that everything was a result of an external being. And when I was very young... I was brought to a priest, you know, to learn about the Catholic tradition and so forth. And I had asked the priest these questions uh, about why do people suffer? Why are some people rich? Why are some people poor? And, and basically the gist of it was don't ask those questions. It's something that you can't understand. And you just have to have faith that it's either a test or it's all part of a bigger picture. And that bothered me. From, from being a little kid on, that those answers to those questions, I wasn't allowed to ask, according to the, the people that I was brought to for spirituality. And they seem like pretty important questions to know the answer to. And it doesn't, you know, I, I was brought up, there was some hard times and a divorce went on. So I had a lot of questions about why we had to suffer so much. And, and I could never really find the answer to that. So Long story short, after a lot of trials and tribulations, you know, trying to find happiness in drugs and trying to find happiness in everything other than something internal, uh, I started to, to know there was a need for, for spirituality in my life uh, after a, a lot of years of, of hard times. And I looked into everything except Buddhism. I went back to the, my Christian roots and I read into it and I hit that same wall of why, 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 why. And it, would, it really would keep me up at night trying to figure out why I you know, was brought up and was living in Madison, Connecticut, but there was someone in Ethiopia who had no chance and had no possibility of getting out. And I couldn't understand why I was there and why they were there. And it kept me up, like I said. And then I, I looked at the Quran. I read the whole Quran. I found it beautiful. I found parts of it to be wonderful. But I didn't connect to it because there was still this creator external thing happening that didn't seem to make sense. And there didn't seem to be this personal responsibility anywhere. It was all up to somebody else. And, and it was like everyone was saying there was a different code that you needed to follow in order to please that someone else. And it didn't make sense. And it, and it was like, well, if... They're the only ones, right? Everybody else is screwed. If they're the only ones, right? Everybody else is screwed. And I couldn't hold on to that. 
got to Hinduism, read the Bhagavad Gita, started to look into the Krishna teachings, and I started to connect a little bit to that. And the reason I got into the Eastern stuff, because I was a musician at the time, and music was all about Eastern influence at the time, the hardcore bands I was in, some of them 108 and Shelter, they were becoming Hare Krishnas, and uh, the youth of today, they were all getting into Hare Krishnas and becoming vegans. So, and I was already a vegetarian by then. I didn't want to hurt animals. Uh, I used to cry at the dinner table when they make me eat meat when I was a little kid. And so I was getting there. I was getting there almost. And then I thought, okay, I'm going to have to do this on my own. And I had heard that Adam Yauk and the Beastie Boys were getting into Buddhism. And I went to the Russell Library in Middletown, Connecticut, and I took out a book. I think it was called uh, Returning to Silence, something like that. And it was not a book on Tibetan Buddhism. It was a book on, I think, Zen Buddhism. But the Four Noble Truths were in there. And that was what changed my life. I read about the Four Noble Truths, and they explained in four sentences every question that I had had since I was a little kid. Why are people suffering? Why is there this difference between here and there? Why do I have a chance? Why don't they have a chance? How can I get out of this? Is this forever? Will this keep going? Does it just end and it's over? And this was all just a big mess? Or was there more purpose? So what does it do for me on my daily life now? It answers those questions that drove me crazy, that drove me out of my mind on a daily basis and gives me a sense of hope that I can become on a daily basis a little bit of a better person than I was the day before. And according to what I've learned, as long as I do that and I continue to try to be a little bit better than I was the, the day before, the minute before, the month before, the year before, then I'm succeeding in this spiritual tradition. And it's not about figuring it all out in this one lifetime. It's about doing the best I can in this lifetime, and Buddhism says I get another chance. But the more that I do good in this lifetime, the better chance I have next time. So every day, now that I really believe that, after all these years of studying and doubts and you know, asking a lot of questions, I never was a, uh, I'm a doubting Thomas. I'm someone who doesn't believe anything. Uh, that's something Rinpoche, our teacher, likes about me, is that from the day he met me, I told him I didn't believe what he was saying about certain points that he would make. Right. I'd say, oh, that sounds ridiculous. And then he would show me through logic why it wasn't ridiculous. He didn't say, don't ask that. He didn't say that I was going to go to hell because I didn't have faith. He told me that I would go to hell if I didn't ask that, if I didn't question it, because I would be ignorant. And ignorance was what was binding me to suffering. So it gives me a sense of purpose, gives me a sense of hope, and it tells me that this isn't all just for nothing. But it doesn't give me a resentment against somebody doing something to me externally. I know that I'm in complete control. I'm in the driver's seat. There's nothing else that can change my destiny but me. Everything that's going to happen to me, I'm in control of. When, where, and the details of that, and when, when all the happinesses that I'm working towards will happen, I may not be in control of in terms of I know when it'll happen, but I'm in control of it happening. Change your mind, and you change your life. Exactly. So many religions, kindness, compassion, patience, wisdom, love, fundamental beliefs. When we think about Tibetan Buddhism, though, why is the West, especially now, so fascinated with Tibetan Buddhism, in your, your thoughts? I think there's a lot of reasons. I think that there is a Hollywood aspect of it. Um, I think that, you know, with a lot of the actors having come out and said they were interested in Buddhism, and as I mentioned before, musicians coming out and saying that they were interested in Buddhism, I think that that made people become fascinated in some sense. Um, I, I think that that's one aspect. We had seven years in Tibet come out a number of years ago. 
Kundun came out by Martin Scorsese. Right. Uh, so there was a really, during that period of time was when, in my eyes, over you know, 20, 30 years now of studying, uh, is, was when there was the most interest. When those movies came out, free Tibet concerts were playing. Um, so that's one reason I think that the West became interested. Uh, because in the 60s there was the people became interested in Eastern stuff because the Beatles and and so forth so I think that has part of it but I also think that because of our Western education and our interest in science science and Buddhism line up together beautifully yeah how does it converge well when you look at quantum physics and you look at uh, which I am in no way a scholar in and, and know very little about but when you look at physics, you look at string theory, you look at a lot of the ways that science says that um, molecules and so forth can't be, you can't find a final particle. Um, that's very similar to the highest view in Tibetan Buddhism. And in Tibetan Buddhism not only studies the nature of reality and how things form and how things come into being, but also there's a whole mind science study in Tibetan Buddhism where they study consciousness, levels of consciousness, uh, the varying, uh, there's one school that says seven different types of consciousness, direct valid cognition, things that we infer, correctly assuming consciousness, doubting consciousness. Uh, so there are these, there are seven different types of consciousnesses. So there's such an emphasis on philosophy and real detail that I think that it appeals to that kind of Western mind. So I think that first the, the Hollywood aspect and the music and got people interested in it because culturally Tibet is very interesting um, and there's a, a lot of very neat things to learn outside of the religious tradition. So I think that people not only got in, interested in the, the philosophy and the religion but the culture also. And, and the, the, the connection to science. And then third I think is that you can ask any question you want. In simplistic forms, break down, if you will, the difference between Zen Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism. And then let's talk about Tibetan Buddha, Buddhism 101, okay. which would be, let's say, um, the three essential teachings, which you had already touched upon, Four Noble Truths, uh, Emptiness, which we, we obviously can't get into, and the Twelve Links of Dependent Origination. Mm. Please. Well. I would say that if you were to look at the two traditions, uh, comparing Zen and Tibetan Buddhism, uh, I've studied very little Zen. Zen relies on much less information. Zen relies um, more, there are things called cones, for instance, where you would be given a sentence and then sent away by your master to think about what the meaning of that is in an abstract way, um, you know, or in whatever way you come to, and then teachings would progress like that. Tibetan Buddhism is highly detailed, highly, it takes 25 years of everyday memorization to get this degree that they get in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition of the Galupa tradition called the Geshe degree. So, there is a huge emphasis on intellectual understanding because according to the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, you have to first intellectually understand something so that A, you know that what you're thinking is correct and B, so that you can realize it non-conceptually. You have to first work, because that's how we work, we work within concepts. So you first have to understand it from a conceptual point and know what intellectually is correct what intellectually is incorrect, and then if you have a realization, you'll have a gauge to know whether or not you actually had a realization. The trouble with not having a kind of emphasis on intellectual understanding is, is that our brains are broken, our minds are broken, so we can make up a lot of fantastical things and we can convince our th ourselves that we've realized things that we haven't. We can, I've heard people say that they've become enlightened over a weekend. And that's because our minds are so broken we can convince ourselves of that. So if there's a framework that I can look at to say, okay, I, I think I had this realization, 
let me see what this realization is supposed to look like, how it would happen, what non-realization is, and let me see if, if that's really what happened or not. If I don't have some kind of framework, then I'm kind of making it up as I go along. And it feels good to do certain breathing meditations. So it's very easy to think that something spiritual has happened. That you can do breathing meditations and, and open up your endorphins in certain ways and you can feel high. And a lot of people have, mistake, have mistaken that high for realization, for nirvana, for enlightenment, when it was just channels and things that worked together and aligned in a way that made them feel bliss. When we talk about the essential points, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but right. would you say the three would be the Four Noble Truths, Emptiness, and Twelve Links of Dependent Origination? I would say, if I was going to divide the teachings, I would divide them by the scopes. Um, because I would say the Twelve Links of Dependent Origination would fall under emptiness. Um, but I would say those are really great starting point topics for sure. If you had those three topics and mastered those three topics, um, you would be well on your way. Um, but if we say, uh, what were the three again? Emptiness, the 12 links of dependent origination, and, four noble truths. and the Four Noble Truths. We're missing with that compassion. Um, and, and I think that if you can break the teachings down into the scopes, then you really cover Precisely. Every single precise teaching of Buddhism. See, the 12 links of dependent origination show how every, uh, lifetimes come into being and go out of being and so forth. Um, and it's dependent origination. So that shows emptiness, basically. It shows that dependent origination is the proof of emptiness. But the Four Noble Truths coupled with that for a Hinayana practitioner, there are two, two um, divisions, Hinayana, which is, translates as the lesser vehicle, and Mahayana, which translates as the great vehicle. The Hinayana believes that one does the practices for themselves alone so that they can reach a nirvana place, a place of freedom for themselves alone, an individual liberation. The great vehicle wishes to become completely enlightened, to become a Buddha, and free all other beings also, as well. So the Hinayana teachings focus on a self-liberation. The Mahayana teachings, which are the great vehicle, focus on liberating everyone, focus on generating compassion and, wish, and, gen, and getting to this place where you want to free all beings from suffering and the causes of suffering, and then you want to become a Buddha because that's the best way to do that. That doesn't fit Impl it, implicitly, if you're speaking of Mahayana, you could speak of it in the Four Noble Truths, but the Four Noble Truths were given as a Hinayana teaching. So the Mahayana is really the only vehicle to become a Buddha. So I would say um, the scopes very quickly, the smallest scope in Buddhism are groupings of teachings on refuge and abstaining from the ten non-virtues and so forth, which will, will then allow you to get a rebirth into the higher realms, have a good rebirth. The next set of teachings are those Hinayana teachings, those teachings of the highest higher trainings in ethics, concentration, and wisdom that allow one to have an individual liberation, their own nirvana. And then there are the teachings for beings of great capacity, which are the Mahayana teachings, where they combine wisdom and method. And that method is the compassion that I was speaking about. The compassion is what makes a Buddha into a Buddha. It's really the root of omniscience. Uh, compassion turns into bodhicitta, which turns into Buddhahood. And, and that's why I would say that the three scopes are the best way to describe it, because then you get fully each and every one of the possibilities that Buddha had to offer. Because Buddha said if it doesn't fall within those three, it's not Buddhism. Buddhas, as we learned today in class, at the Chen Rezig Tibetan Buddhist Center, the goal of Buddhism is only to, to, really, to become liberated, to become a Buddha. It's not for any other goal, not to feel good, not to have a good day. It, those are side effects, but there's nowhere the Buddha taught, do this to feel good, do this so your day is better, do this so you're nicer. Everything was for your next life. 
everything the Buddha taught. But byproduct is you become nicer, hopefully. You know, you, you become a little more compassionate. And that's the gauge that it's working. And that's, that's where you can look in yourself and see the changes and know whether it's real or not. Two misconceptions that people have. One is karma. Oh. The other one is meditation. Everybody sure. thinks, everybody thinks I have to sit in a lotus position, I have yes. to close my eyes, I have to... Because they don't come to understand gom in Tibetan, meditation, means familiarize. Yes. Simply familiarize. That said, single mind point concentration and analytical meditation. Yes. That's meditation. Yes. Familiarize yourself. Yes. Continue. Meditation, when I first got here to Buddhism, I thought it was in silence in a mountaintop, you know, all alone <laughs> and emptying my mind of all thoughts. And somehow that was the goal, that I was going to be able to be alone for a long time and not think about anything. That's what I thought I was going to do. Um, and then I came to find out what you said, that meditation is what we've chosen to translate gom as. And gom, if we look at the word in Tibetan, really means to familiarize, to become familiar more and more. So you can be driving down the street and thinking about the Four Noble Truths, and you're meditating according to Buddhism. <laughs> exactly. There's no mountain, <laughs> there's no wind and emptying of the mind. Buddha said if you empty your mind, you're getting nowhere. <laughs> That is not the goal of anything that we do to empty the mind. It's actually a wrong view that was brought into Buddhism by a master named Hashan that said that emptying your mind is the goal. Conceptual thought is bad. Um, but Buddha taught that familiarizing is what meditation is. There's analytical meditation where you familiarize yourself with topics. You think over and over again. If you're learning about suffering, you think of all the different types of suffering, all the different ways we suffer and so forth. Why we suffer, that's analytical meditation. Single-pointed meditation is where you take one focal object and you focus your mind on that alone. You, you a pick a Buddha or a topic, um, much harder, easier to use an image, but you focus on that and that alone and your mind does not move from any other one place to the other. It's no only drifting. focusing on that one object. And the misunderstanding about karma, because everybody that's will say, "That's where I was going oh, next." That's you, the you, worst. You one. make a mistake, that's yeah. bad karma. Yep. On it. You do something good, it's meritorious. It might be virtuous. It's not karma. Right. This There's, is the big clear up. And that's obviously, needed. we can't get into throwing karma, no, projecting it's even karma. Too much. Right. Precisely with with the time we have remaining, but simplistically break it down so oh, people yeah. understand karma. Karma is action. <laughs> That's what the Sanskrit word karma means. Action. When, when you lie, that's an action. That's a non-virtuous karma. When you do something good, you're generous. That's an action. That's a virtuous karma. Your karma is just the collection of seeds that you have in your mental continuum from every life you've ever lived, the good deeds that you did, the good actions, the good karmas, produce happiness. The bad deeds you did, the bad karmas, produce suffering. That's it. <laughs> that's, that's all karma is. You know, we say, oh, I must have bad karma because I'm, I'm suffering. Well, that's kind of right. Bad, you did something bad, so you had bad action before. Bad action before causes suffering. So it is true, I'm having a lot of suffering, that's bad karma. But the way that we use it in slang, and the way that folks think that karma is this energy that's floating around that is almost like a god. Karma is this action that's hanging out in our mind that's creating every experience that we have. Every experience, everything we see, is caused, everything good we see is caused by good things we did. Everything bad we see was caused by bad things that we did. And it's so simplistic and so clear to understand that. And as a scientist, you see that causes are concordant, I mean, results are concordant with their causes. You don't put milk and water together and get chocolate milk. 
you need chocolate, and you need milk, and then you have chocolate milk. So it's so clear that we have varieties of experiences, so there have to be a variety of causes for our experiences, no? Before I ask you my last question, sure. you have to impart the drop, the bucket, and the ocean. Okay. Uh, it is said in Buddhism that uh, we must, whenever we do virtuous things, uh, there is a part of Buddhism where we dedicate our virtues, where we dedicate the good things that we've done to a, a specific goal. Um, and in Buddhism, the goal is Buddhahood. We want to become a Buddha so that we can make everyone else, help everyone else become Buddhas. Uh, so the Buddha had said that all of our virtue can become a cause for that result if we direct it at that. If our motivation is, I'm doing this so that I can become a Buddha to help all beings, then that'll be what it causes. So the Buddha said, just like a drop of water from a bucket that's put into the ocean isn't extinguished until the entire ocean is extinguished, likewise, virtue that's properly dedicated to your Buddhahood will be what causes that Buddhahood, will we'll hang around until it becomes a cause for your enlightenment. Um, so it's so important that we dedicate the virtues that we've done for a specific purpose. Because if we know that our, the good things that we do cause happiness, the bad things that we do cause suffering, we can do some good things. And then if we don't dedicate it to our goal of becoming a Buddha, it might just make it so we have an, a delicious ice cream cone next week or next year or next life instead of freedom from suffering altogether. So With the 60 seconds we have, okay. as a Buddhist, yes. Jeff Allen wants to make what contributions, small, large, one, many, the contribution you want to make so that you feel that the meaning, the usefulness of your life has come to this. The contribution would be what? I want to see that the knowledge that my teacher has brought to me, to us, but to me, I'm speaking personally, doesn't disappear with my life. I want to make sure that that knowledge, that wisdom uh, is shared with others um, and imparted to others and the texts that we're missing to fill in the blanks for some of the information that we just don't have now in English uh, be brought into English. So that's, that's what I, I want. I want to see Rinpoche's message of the Mahayana brought to more people than just me and just the few people at our center uh, in a much bigger sense. And, and I, I would like to see some of the texts that haven't been brought into English, brought into English. Without making you feel uncomfortable, for years I've been wanting to sit down like this and have a conversation with you. Jeff Allen, translator for Rinpoche, Chen Rezig, Tibetan Buddhist Center, Middletown, Connecticut, thank you for doing this. Thank you so much. Jeff, truly appreciate it. I wish we had hours. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> In fact, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you might have to do a part two. Okay. I'd like that a lot. I would too. And thank you for joining us for Talk About Our Times. I'm Lich. See you next time. Until then, keep me in your thoughts. <laughs>